Welcome back to the swamp my friends and welcome if you are new. Today we're going to be sharing some creepy and downright strange horror stories from the middle of nowhere. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. Be sure to hit that like button, subscribe if you're new, and turn on notifications so you don't miss a new episode, and get ready for these creepy and downright strange middle of nowhere horror stories. Let me guess, your medicine cabinet is crammed with stuff that doesn't work. You still aren't sleeping, you're still achy and hurt, you're stressed out just as much as ever. That's how it was for me. So I cleared out my cabinet and reset my health with CBD from CB Distillery. It's been a real change. CB Distillery's targeted formulations are made from the highest quality clean ingredients. No fluff, no fillers, just pure, effective CBD solutions designed to help support your health. In two non-clinical surveys, 81% of customers experienced more calm. 80% said CBD helped with pain after physical activity, and an impressive 90% said they slept better with CBD. If you struggle with a health concern and haven't found relief, make the change like I did to CB Distillery. And with over 2 million customers and a solid 100% money-back guarantee, CB Distillery is the source to trust. I have a 20% discount code to get you started. Visit cbdistillery.com and use code SWAMPED for 20% off. That's cbdistillery.com, code SWAMPED, cbdistillery.com. Rural Dogman Encounter by Fave So. So this one is hard to remember, as my mind could be better at remembering things. To clarify, I live in Brazil, specifically in the countryside of Rio Grande do Sul, and while my belief in the supernatural is almost non-existent, I can swear to God that what I saw to this day was real. Also, I'm sorry for any English mistakes since it is not my first language. So as I said, I live in the countryside. Our rural town making frontier to the big city down the road takes quite a bit. I'm a devoted Christian, but my autism does not allow me to stay too long at the church, as I'm too imperative to sit down and listen to it. So, most of the time, I tend to leave the church early. This was another day I had to go, and I had to leave early. This area of the street had no asphalt. It was all dirt. Walking back home, listening to music on my phone, I suddenly stopped and looked at a nearby tree. It was hard to describe what I saw due to the insufficient lighting as the sun was setting, but from the shapes of the branches, I could see a black, humanoid figure with red eyes and black horns. Although I don't think it noticed me, I started to run, and then I looked behind me to be sure that this thing was not chasing me. The moment I looked back, however, there was something else on the street. It was a dog. A really big dog. Its fur was black as the darkness itself. Its eyes were bloodshot red. The thing just sat down on the road, looking at me. I kept running, but the dog never seemed to follow me, but it still stared at me with those deep red eyes. Despite the running and having to walk on foot, I got home quickly and wasn't too terribly far from the church. It's weird, but I noticed how everything seemed too quiet while the dog was there. Usually things are still going on in the neighborhood, but it was as if everyone decided to hide away. For context, my home is in a hill-like area with three other houses. The first one is my grandmother, and then you go up a slight bump in the road until you reach my home. Up on the back is where my grandparents used to live, the gate for this house is now down there, so you must shout to get their attention to open it. My grandmother wasn't home at the time, so I kept playing on my computer until my parents were finally back home. Everything went okay until I suddenly heard something from outside. A voice coming from out there, in a calming, yet creepy manner. It almost sounded like a hoarse whisper, like somebody saying, Hey, open the door. It freaked me out so bad. So I hid in my room and waited for my grandparents to get home, and I didn't say anything to anybody about it ever until I shared this story with you. Something Hides in the Hills of Texas by John 
Howdy, I'm John from Texas. I won't say where for privacy reasons, but I live 10 miles away from my friend Willie's house. He has a lot of acres of land and rides a lot of horses. I live in the suburbs, so I'm going to the country and riding with him, and I'm doing that fairly often, and I enjoy it. I'm 17, and he's 19, and we always make jokes like, Don't pull the reins too hard, boy. To where I always reply, I'm two goddamn years younger than you will. But we never really take it to heart, and it's always just been good fun between brothers. We aren't kin, but he's like my older brother. In the autumn of 2018, when I was 13 and he was 15, we rode one day and planned on staying the night in the prairie about a mile or two away from the house. I got on a six-year-old white stud named Jesse, and Willie got on a three-year-old brown horse named James. Yes, his parents named those horses after the famous outlaw Jesse and James. Weird, but who am I to judge? Anyway, we set out on our ride at dawn. I say dawn because we did not care about what time it actually was. We were ready to ride the prairies, the woods, and rolling hills of rural Texas to our heart's content. As we rode on for hours and hours, we did nothing but joke around and sing dumb old cowboy songs Willie had learned from his grandfather. In the case of coyotes and snakes, Willie had a revolver on his hip, and I brought along my 30-30 rifle. All we needed were pocket knives, but I don't think we had any spare ones besides the one that was special to us, but I had it on me anyway, but I didn't really want to use it. A friend who used to live in my neighborhood who was Native American gave it to me as a gift of thanks for keeping his bully off his back. I never asked what tribe he was from, though, but I sharpen the knife daily, and it's super sharp, so if needed, you know, It'll get the job done. When I first started growing my facial hair, I would use it to shave it. I don't know why, but it resulted in a nasty cut one day. But it's worth it for me, a 13-year-old at the time, to feel manly. Speaking of feeling manly, Willie and I found a small lake to swim in. The only problem was that it was cold as ice. So we dared each other to cannonball right into the freezing lake water. Boys will be boys, I guess. We stripped down to our boxers and jumped in. It was so much fun to feel the freezing water all over me in a hot summer's day. Willie and I splashed around until three men rode up on horseback. They were a couple of years older than us, give or take. They dressed like we were in cowboy hats, flannel shirts, cowboy boots, and bandanas around their necks. The one in the middle, who appeared to be the youngest, leaned on his saddle horn and stared daggers at us with his bright blue eyes. He spoke, What are you boys doing in these parts, huh? Willie answered back, Uh, swimming? <laughs> Who the hell do you think you are? The guy was laughing, and he drew his revolver on his side, pointing it at us. The other two guys followed his lead. How about y'all get your delicate asses out of that water and put your clothes back on? He said, aiming it at us with a steady hand. We got out, put our clothes back on, even though we were soaking wet. Willie dropped the revolver on his hip, and I dropped my pocket knife. Then we put our hands up. What, what do you want? I asked him. I'll tell you what the hell I want, boy. I want you off my goddamn property. Me and my posse are staying here a spell, so you best get out of here. He said with a grin, but at the same time super aggressively. Me and Willie both agreed to leave, but we couldn't have honestly made up this crazy, hostile, you know, J-head out of nowhere. Like, there's no way this guy had suddenly come and commandeered this area. We rode for another mile or two before we called the police. Or at least tried to because the signal was absolutely awful. With no way to call the cops and barely being able to connect to a tower, we decided to deal with them ourselves. So we rode into the prairie, set up camp, and waited. I had my 30-30, and Willie had his revolver ready. Ten riders rolled up to us an hour after sunset, kicking up dust. They all had their guns drawn, and they all glared at us with the desire to put us out of our misery right then and there. All of them but one. The same smiling J-head that pointed his gun at us earlier. There was something off about him. Even though he didn't look crazy, he was not all there mentally. They walked past our fire toward us, pistol drawn and ready to blow our heads off. Willie and myself had no idea what we were going to do or why this was even happening. The crazy guy got about a foot away from me and looked right at me. The crazy guy got about a foot away from me and looked me right in my eyes and said, I don't think we personally met, partner. I'm Billy. He put his gun away and stuck his hand out to shake mine. I shook his hand and told him my name was John. John, huh? A mighty fine name. Billy looked over at Willie. You got a name, amigo? My name's Willie, Willie said in a stern voice. Well, John, 
Willie, I want y'all to know I don't mean no harm, but I best not see you in this spot again. You understand? Billy stared at us, if expecting us to say we would leave. But Willie pointed to his pistol, and Billy also then began to yell, You can kiss my ass. This is my property, my parents, my probability. You must leave right now before I... It was cut off by the sound of a gun hammer being clicked. All the riders had their guns aimed at me and Willie. Billy grabbed Willie by his shirt collar and put his gun under his chin. You leave now, boy, or I'll blow your goddamn head off, he said to Willie. Billy got back on his horse, and then he and his men rode off. We got back on our horses and rode back to the house to use the landline to call the police and warn Willie's parents about the crazy horse riders on their property. When we told them what had happened, they didn't believe us in the slightest and wanted to search the whole property before calling the cops. Sure enough, we couldn't find evidence of anybody other than Willie and me ever being there. When I started thinking all about the guys who were riding the horses, they dressed like cowboys and were led by a young guy named Billy. So, after some talking and some digging, we are in a historical area where Billy the Kid would have been running around. So no freaking way. Did we have a ghostly encounter with Billy the Kid and his crew? How were we able to travel in time like that? Could it have been something to do with that special pocket knife? I don't know. That, that, that's never happened to me before. But it was terrifying and exciting all at the same time. Rachel, Mindy, and Nathan were excited to finish their freshman year of college. They decided to take a road trip to an old campground that is known for its beautiful scenery. It is well off the beaten path, but so is anything else worth seeing. Nathan was driving as they turned off the main road. Well, say goodbye to civilization, Nathan said. I know, isn't this awesome? Finally, no more assignments for a while, Mindy answered. Right, Rachel? Mindy turned to see Rachel fast asleep in the back seat. I guess being on the Dean's list is tiring, Nathan laughingly said. Mindy was staring out the window as it got quiet. As they drove deeper into the country, Mindy noticed the old house off in the distance. Well, I didn't think anyone lived out here, Mindy said quietly. They don't, Nathan replied. There's a house right there. Looks creepy though, Mindy said. That's because it is, Nathan replied. What do you mean? Mindy asked. Off this old highway a few hundred yards down a church driveway, people who live around here know to stay away. The house has a bad history. Everyone has seen it. Everyone and anyone who has crossed the path from going from point A to point B has looked to the side at night and seen that lonely dark house routing by itself. Although over the years it has gotten a fair amount of attention, said Nathan. What kind of bad history? Mindy asked. Nathan turned and looked at Mindy in her eyes and said with a seductive smile, Do you really want to know? Mindy laughed and answered back, I sure do. Nathan sat back and took a deep breath. I did a little research. In 1924, a family lived there. Apparently the father fell on hard times and went absolutely crazy. He killed his family, then brought their bones into the cellar with a shovel, and, uh, you know, nobody ever saw them again. Or him. So... He just closed the cellar door, and that was it, Mindy said. Yes, with a shovel. <laughs> God knows what he did down there, said Nathan. It was getting dark, and Mindy looked at the house as Nathan pulled over to use the bathroom. The setting sun cast an eerie light on the backdrop of the house. As Nathan got back and Misty looked at him, and as Nathan reached for the ignition, Mindy stopped him. No, I want to see it, Mindy said. Nathan looked back at Rachel to see that she was still sleeping. Mm, let's do it, Nathan said, as he reached for Mindy. Mindy pushed him away. No, I'm serious, I want to see the house. The inside of it. Uh, I want to see what happened, Mindy said as she looked into his eyes worriedly. Nathan could not believe it. You're serious? You want to see what's inside? He asked. Yes, Mindy said, as she held his arm. Nathan looked down at her, and back up at her. Then, Nathan looked at his watch and over at the house. Okay, let's wake up Rachel. Mindy woke Rachel up and told her that they were going to do something awesome, as Nathan got the backpacks ready to be carried. Mindy told Rachel she could stay in the van if she wanted to, and Rachel tried to talk her out of it. Are you crazy? Why do you want to go see it? Mindy told her she had to know what happened. Why don't you just, you know, go look for police records or something? Besides, that was a hundred years ago. What if there's some crazy person in there? 
Mindy rolled her eyes and began walking down the driveway as Nathan caught up with her. Rachel looked around as it was turning into night and hurried to catch up with them. As they got to the house, a loud thud came from inside. See? There's someone in there. They know we're here, Rachel said. It's an old house, probably rotting wood falling, Nathan said as he turned to Mindy and smiled. They reached the front door. As Nathan tried the knob, to their surprise, the door opened. It was dark and dusty. They couldn't see anything, so Nathan used his flashlight from his camping gear. They walked around examining things. Kids' toys, baby clothes, a straw hat, a tobacco pipe. Looks like they just up and left, Nathan said. I guess nobody bothered to try to clean up. They just let it all sit in here until the house collapses, huh? Yeah, well, they probably figured nobody would come in here, Rachel snapped. Let's stay together, Nathan said as they made their way to the back of the house. When they made it to the back room, there was another thud. Okay, guys, seriously, let's get out of here. That wasn't falling wood, Rachel turned to Nathan. Nathan, please, let's go. Make Mindy come on. Rachel pleaded. Nathan looked at her and then looked down at the ground. He looked up again. You're right. This is not our business. We shouldn't be here, he said. Rachel let out a sigh of relief, but just as she thought she had won, Mindy found something. Hey guys, look. The cellar. Let's go down there and see what the father did. Maybe we will find something that was left behind. Mindy said in a trance-like voice, uh, Earth to Mindy, hello, uh, no, we're not going into the cellar, okay? Rachel argued. If you're so scared, you can go back to the van, Mindy snapped. Rachel took her up on that offer and hurried back to the van. I'll wait in the van, but don't take forever, she spoke. Mindy assured her that they would be out soon. Mindy and Nathan looked at the cellar door and then at each other. Nathan slowly reached for the door and pushed it open. A dark stairway led to an area that was pitch black. Nathan shined his light down and they slowly took it step by step until they were at the bottom. Mindy grabbed Nathan by the arm as he shone his light around. There's a shovel, he spoke. I bet that's the same one the father used to bury his family down here. But where is he? They slowly walked around, shining the flashlight around as it revealed more clues. Nathan shined his light on the mound of dirt. Look, Mindy, I bet these mounds are where he buried them, he spoke. Mindy covered her mouth with her hand as she walked around the mound. Look, Nathan, a mound, but it looks unfinished. Where's all the dirt? Mindy said confusingly. Nathan walked over to shine the light directly on it. He got a creepy feeling. There's no dirt around it, because that wasn't dug from the outside. It was dug from underground. Nathan stepped back and turned around to desperately shine his light around. His light began flickering. Oh no, the flashlight's going dead, he said as he repeatedly hit it to try to get the light back on. Each time it died. Mindy started sobbing. Nathan, let's get out of here. Something is down here, she said. She held his arm. The flashlight died for good, and it was pitch black. Suddenly, the cellar door slams shut. Nathan and Mindy stopped moving. R rachel Nathan said. It was dead quiet. Rachel, is that you? He said again. After a moment of quiet, Mindy screamed. Rachel, it's not funny. Open the door. It was pitch dark and quiet as Mindy and Nathan stood there in a cellar, not knowing who was there or where to go. Suddenly, something grabbed Nathan and Mindy and pulled them by their legs, dragging them underground as Mindy screamed. Rachel was sitting in the van when she heard a faint scream in the distance. She got out of the van and ran into the house screaming. Mindy, Mindy, where are you? She followed the screams to the cellar door as she tried to open it but couldn't. The scream from the cellar stopped and Rachel covered her mouth to try to stop her panting from being heard. Rachel heard footsteps coming up the stairs from the other side of the door. Rachel ran out of the house to the van and jumped in the driver's seat. She reached down to the ignition and let out a sigh of relief as she realized the keys were in there. She turned the van crank over as she turned her head to the house. The door to the house slowly closed as the van started. Rachel was just sobbing as she jammed the gas pedal and drove away. Rachel reported what happened to the police and filed a missing persons report on Mindy and Nathan. The local authorities searched the house and the cellar but found no traces of them. The only thing they found were a flashlight. Although one of the policemen thought he heard a faint screaming coming from deep underground, 
When he asked his partner if they could hear it too, they claimed they could not. Rachel told the police about the footsteps and the door closing as she left. Nobody knows what happened to the bodies of Mindy and Nathan, and Rachel was convinced that they are still down there. And if you go to that house and stand in the cellar, you will hear their cries for help. There have been three instances in my life where I have felt like I was going to be abducted. I'm a woman, and I'm currently 23 years old. I'm also on the petite side, standing at a whopping 5 foot 3 and weighing roughly around 115 pounds. Because of this, I typically wear heels or platform boots so that I can appear taller than I actually am. This story happened this spring while at a second-hand store. I was looking to find a good side table style cabinet and my boyfriend came with me because I have already been nearly abducted twice in my life. I could write about these in the future if you would like. And I suffer from CPTSD in part of that, so I'm not really able to go out in public by myself unless I'm with someone, going to class, or going to work. Lucky for me, my boyfriend is 6 foot 3, lean but muscular, has a very deep, intimidating voice, and has absolutely no issues with taking physical action if I needed it. But, basically, it's like having my own caring, personal bodyguard. For context, the area I live in is bad for human trafficking. I live in northern Wisconsin, but close to Minneapolis. The I-94 runs basically straight to Minneapolis from the Dells. I grew up in that area and I know full well that the Dells has bad trafficking issues too because of the high levels of tourism in that area. Plus, Baraboo, the next town over from the Dells, still has running cargo trains that are rumored to be contributing to the trafficking. But that's not entirely relevant. The town I currently live in is split in half by the same interstate, and there's a Walmart right by the exit, also infamous for trafficking. There have been many abductions of women in our town in various locations all over, and it isn't a secret to anybody that it's an issue for the area. Now, with the story. My boyfriend and I go to the next town over to look for a cabinet styled side table because the secondhand shops in our town don't sell furniture. We get inside and look around a little bit before my boyfriend says he needs to go to the bathroom. I keep browsing nearby the bathrooms in a display area for desks, dressers, etc. And I find this neat vintage vanity with hidden organizers in the top of the desk and I start looking at it and checking out its little features. While doing so, I feel eyes on me, so I look around to see if I'm being watched by someone. Sure enough, in the row of desks behind me, there's a middle-aged man looking at me with no facial expressions. I'm dressed in a skirt and knee socks, and this is one of my go-to looks, so glaring at creepy men eyeing me up isn't something new to me, but since I'm alone now and don't want to anger the guy, I give him the cliche Midwestern half-smile and move up the row away from him but towards the corner of the section. Suddenly, this guy practically runs to the row I'm in, so I take a right and head up towards where he was standing when I initially spotted him. He picks up pace, and I am now half running, trying to get away from him, and after a small chase around the furniture, we end up in a situation where I'm standing on one side of the row of desk and he is standing on the other, waiting to see which way I will go, at a standstill. At this moment, I try looking to my left towards the other furniture and bathrooms to see if anyone is around to witness this, and thank Gaia, my boyfriend is out of the bathroom already walking towards us with a very squared up posture. He looks livid and his eyes are locked solidly onto this creep that was chasing me around the furniture just a second ago. My boyfriend reaches my side and puts his arm around my shoulder protectively and he and the creep make eye contact. They honestly both looked equally angry. The guy doesn't say anything just walks away, but every few minutes or so we see him looking at us from a few miles away, wherever we are in the store, and I am anxious as hell at this point and just want to leave, but my boyfriend is trying to do his best to reassure me and calm me down in the best way he knows, but with no avail. He eventually distracts me from the guy by finding a perfect side table that I was looking for. Dark cherry wood, glass door, shelves, beautiful and only $30, not to mention a student discount. We picked it up and head to the checkout. The entire time I am paranoid and looking around to see if this guy is near us. He is currently being checked out at the register and we are being separated by two other customers. My anxiety spikes again but I try not to let it show. When he is done, 
He walks through the first set of doors to exit, but is still in the first entrance of the store just standing there. He looks at me, and we make eye contact a few times while I'm in line and then checking out. I make it a point to stand on the right side of my boyfriend, carrying my new find out and holding eye contact with the creep the whole time we exit and get to the car. He doesn't say or do anything. He didn't follow us. He just stared at me, and we get to the car safely. Although I am still paranoid and trying to get the side table in the car and secure it as fast as possible, which is just making me fumble more, but regardless, we left safe and made it home okay. I can't say for certain that this man was trying to abduct me, let alone if he was working with human traffickers, but I highly doubt he was chasing and stalking me around the store with pure intentions. So these are four experiences I've had growing up in a small town in western Michigan from the age of 6 to 18, when I eventually left the state. I will put them in order of how they happened. When I was 6 years old, during the summer, I would always wake up before my mom and walk to our living room and look out of our sliding door for deer. My parents owned about 7 acres, and almost all of it was an open field. This particular morning though, I walked up to the slider and looked out and the only way I can describe what I saw was this big-headed black dog thing that was just staring back at me from less than 100 yards away. It looked like it was just staring me in the eyes, like it knew I had just saw it. It almost knew that I had just walked up to the sliding glass door, I felt. I saw it leaning on a low-hanging branch, and it just didn't seem right. The head was so massive. Most of my family owned large dogs, so I knew it just didn't seem quite right. It seemed more dog-like rather than bear-like. I sprinted back to my room and waited until my mom woke up but never said anything about it. The second weird thing I saw years later was of course another morning when I woke up in early November when I was 10 years old, again looking for deer. This time I saw something running along the tree line about 100 yards away. It was about the height of a Great Dane if I had to guess, and had a silverish gray color. It wasn't multicolor, just one flat color, and it was huge. The head, again, was shaped more like a wolf. Its fur was short, but it wasn't shaggy, which was weird because in November, in Michigan, everything was getting its winter coat. It was just trotting along the wood line, stopping, and what looked like marking, and then it would keep on walking just like a dog or a wolf would. But it was incredibly tall and unbelievably quick. The third encounter was when I was 13 years old and just got into trapping. I was setting up a trap one night, hoping to catch a coyote. Suddenly, I hear just this absolute heart-thumping, bone-snapping sound coming from the woods. All I hear is these snaps and crunches. I then realize there are no birds making any noises at all. I know you shouldn't turn your back and run if you ever think there's a predator, but I was not sticking around to see what was making that noise. I went out the next day with my 3030 and retrieved my trapping gear. Surprisingly, nothing even touched the bait. The final story is the one that scared me the most. I was 17 years old, it was a summer evening, and we would leave our sliding glass door open sometimes just with our screen door closed so we could have a nice breeze in the house. We had a black lab that would just lay by the screen door and smell all the scents from outside. She normally did this every night. But on this night in question, she started to growl and her hackles came up and she slowly walked away from the door. So I walked over to the screen door and in the wood line a little over 100 yards away, I could hear something heavy moving through the woods. I always kept a flashlight near the door because I would like to shine and see how many deer would walk through the field at night and also be able to see where my dog was. No, I never poached a deer or shot at them at night. I just like to see how many there were walking around. So, while I shined the light, I saw a set of eyes pop up in this clearing in the woods. The light was not quite bright enough to pick up anything but eye shine. So, when I saw the eyes, they definitely weren't the, the whites of a deer's eyes, that's for sure. They were bluish red. Like, just a color I don't even know how to explain. They were wider apart than a deer as well, or anything I had ever seen before. Now, I couldn't tell you the exact distance it was because the clearing was probably about 75 yards long and 40 yards wide, but the eyes were unusually far apart, and it wasn't blinking. It just stared at me. Seemingly, 
soulless. As I'm writing this, I have goosebumps all over me. So, after staring for a minute, I decided to make a deer snort sound to see if it would turn its head. No dice. I made the noise three more times, very loudly, and to no avail, it just stared, not blinking at all. So I decided I would stomp on the wooden deck. I stomped twice, and it woke up my brother, and my mom came out and asked me what was going on. The whole time I just stared back at this thing, and it stared back at me, and it never blinked. I decided that I needed to go back inside and lock the door. Ever since then I have had no clue what it was, but I guess I never really have wanted to find out either. Thanks for listening to these creepy and downright strange middle of nowhere horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. If you enjoyed these stories, be sure to hit that like button as it helps me out a ton. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes it, and that helps the swamp grow its ever-expanding waters. If you're new, be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications, as I upload videos just like this one multiple times a week on all things natural and supernatural. If you have a favorite story, definitely comment it down below. I love to see your reviews. If you have any suggestions, be sure to throw them down there as well. Always looking for new topic ideas. Again, if you have a story you would like to share, be sure to send it in at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description. Thank you guys so much for supporting the swamp the way you do. Don't forget to join me over on my second channel, Swamp Dweller Live, if you're into lol cow and fun internet mystery type stuff. And I'll see you all soon with another creepy episode.